very, very privileged today for having Professor Zayed Iyadat with us. Professor da Zayed Iyadat, he is the director of the Center for Strategic Studies at the University of Jordan, former vice president of international affairs, quality and accreditation. He was also the member of, he's also the member of the Royal Committee to modernize the political system in Jordan and a member of Jordan Economic Vision of 2030. Dr. Iyadat is Professor of Political <clears throat> Science and International Relations and the founding dean of Prince Hussein School of International Studies at University of Jordan. He received his PhD in political science from University of Southern California. He has a particular interest in conflict and peace studies, geostrategic and strategic analysis, game theory, which we were talking about yesterday, game theory uh, and political Islam, human rights, yeah. public policies, Middle East, West Asian politics, refugee and migration issues. He is the author of Jordanian, Jihadist and the Fall of ISIS, the Dynamics of Extremism, Terrorism and Counter Policies, which was published in 2022. The English translation of A Better World, Global Justice Between Leviathan and Cosmopolis, Writings of Political Philosophy, which was published in 2020. Islam, State and Modernity, Muhammad Abdel Jaber and the Future of the Arab World. Migration, Security, and Citizenship in Middle East, which was published in 2018. Transition Without Players, The Role of Political Parties in the Arab Revolutions, published in 2015. The Arab Revolutions of 2011, an illustrative model, which was published in 2012. The Rationality of Political Violence, Modeling Al-Qaeda Against the US, published in 2007. The Calculus of Consensus, an Alternative Path to Arab Democracy, published in 2007. Dr. Iyadat has received visiting professorships and scholarships from several different American and European universities, including Georgetown University, which is very famous in USA. He also has advisory roles in many governmental and non-governmental institutions, including the Royal Hashemite Court of Jordan, where he worked at the office of His Majesty King Abdullah II from 2006 to 11. He works proactively as a policy and strategy consultant for civil society, international agencies, and several UN organizations. Professor Iyadat is also one of the founders of All Jordan Youth Commission a non-governmental organization that designs policies and programs that encourage political participation and civic engagement with the aim of integrating Jordanian youth into political processes. He chairs the board of trustees of the Arab Renaissance for Democracy and Development and is a member of the steering committee of the Center for Global Ethics and Politics at the University of Lewis and the Institute of West Asia and North Africa and a member of the editorial boards of several scientific journals. So you can see how many books he has written, right? Which is very, very difficult also to write and very difficult to study also. But we are very, very thankful that we have such an intellectual uh, uh, asset who has you know, spent so much of time in academia and also civil society to guide us today. So now I would hand over the presentation to Professor Ayadat. Shukran. Shukran Jazeelan. Assalamu alaikum. Well, this is such a pleasure, Professor Shabdan. I really appreciate the, the invitation to speak today to this very prestigious place, Institute, and to be meeting you and your students and the audience. Uh, we in Jordan and in the Arab world at large, we look, uh, you know, in a very positive and favorite way to India, India scholars, India academic institutions as well. And, uh, you know, through during my career, I've met a lot of uh, brilliant Indian uh, scholars in various uh, topics, uh, but particularly also in, in political science and in, in philosophy. Uh, so being uh, part of your guest speakers to this uh, group of people, a group of students, gives me the pleasure and also the opportunity to share some uh, ideas uh, about Palestine, about the region, and about maybe most importantly the current war uh, that Israel is launching against the Palestinians in Gaza. So uh, allow me first 
to provide a kind of very quick historical background. So Arab has a very profound long history in the Middle East. Arabia and the Levant, and then the Nile and North Africa. So that area from Morocco all the way to Bahrain is where the, Arab reside, the Arabs reside, and that's their history. They mainly came from Yemen, as you know, Yemen and, and Al Jazeera Al Arabiya, the Arab Peninsula, and uh, in Syria and in Iraq and Egypt and, and Morocco and the rest of these countries. There are 22 Arab countries. Uh, and the modern Arabs political history basically started 8th, 19th century, early 20th century. Uh, defining uh, occasions, uh, events, been of course the World War Two, World War One and World War Two back in 1914-18, and then uh, during the 30s and the 40s, where most of our countries, except for of course Egypt and and Morocco, uh, they they gained uh, they achieved their independence from colonial powers. And the colonial powers uh, in the region were uh, mainly in the in the east and in the Gulf, uh, Britain and, and and France, and in North Africa, uh, France and and Italy. Uh, just remind you that Tunisia, uh, I mean Libya, was subjected to the Italian uh, colonization occupation mandate, if you you call it uh, according to how you think of that. Uh, and then the national independence stasis started, as I said, uh, early, later 20s, and then 30s, and then 40s, and then 50s. Actually, most of, uh, except for Saudi Arabia, the rest of all Gulf countries, they received their independence from Britain in the 70s. Uh, so that tells you, in terms of, of, of history for states, uh, national state concept, this is the West Vibian Western concept of what is Westvalian, I mean, concept what a nation state is, is very new. Uh, and during very long history, the entire Arab world was part of the uh, Islamic empire that started basically in Syria, in Damascus, under the Umayyad, after, you know, the... Uh, the Jews of Islam, Islam was established in the, uh, you know, 600, the 6th century in, in Saudi Arabia, and then spread to uh, neighboring countries, including Iraq, Syria, uh, and, and Iran, of course, uh, and others. So the Arab Arabs, our Arab people, are part of this area, been under these empires, Umayyad, Abbasid, all the way over then 20, I mean, 14 centuries, till the collapse of the Ottoman Empire after World War I. And then they became independent states, as I said, after they got that independence from the uh, colonializations, uh, Britain and, 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 and the France. Uh, now, also I would like to tell you something about the Arabs. Arabs are the not the majority of Muslims. Now, majority of Arabs are Muslim, but, but Arabs are not the majority of Muslims. In fact, uh, India and, and Indonesia, Muslims in India and Indonesia and the other part of Asia are the majority of uh, Muslims, but Arabs are not. Uh, Arabs, you know, counting up to 400 million, uh, 75 to 80 percent of them are Muslims. Uh, more 20, 22, 23, 24 percent of them are Christians, uh, and there are a lot of big number of Arab Jews who used to live in the Arab countries, and some of them are still living in some Arab countries. Uh, so this is this is to tell you that you know when you look at look at the Arabs uh, in terms of ethnicity, uh, they're very unified. Uh, uh, very unitary, but when it comes to uh, ways of, of life in terms of religion, cultures, and political views, there there varies. 
Uh, but it's important to know that there are uh, the majority of Arabs are Muslim and the majority of Muslims Arabs are Sunni, while the minority of them are Shia. Uh, you know that gives you an idea uh, when we talk about the politics uh, in this region. Now let me focus more on Palestine, as as you know, Palestine uh, we call it Palestine. Uh, it is the area between uh, the uh, the sea and the river, from the Mediterranean to Jordan River, the very sacred river uh, in Jordan. And if, when we talk about Jordan, uh, East Jordan and West Jordan, it's the two banks of the river, the east of it is Jordan, the west of it is Palestine. And Palestine, historical Palestine, is that entire area from the sea to the river. And by that, it would be bordering, obviously, you know, Jordan, uh, Lebanon, and, and, and Syria, and the Mediterranean, <clears throat> and of course, Egypt towards the sea. Uh, and this Husserka Palestine been part of that Arab Islamic empires since Islam till the collapse of the Ottoman empires. So the most recent uh, Islamic empire state that governed Palestine as Palestine was the Ottomans. Uh, till, as I said, the Ottomans collapsed in World War I. Uh, and then the British came into the game, replacing the Ottomans, and they became mandated to rule over Palestine. And they divide Palestine between, you know, as I said, East and West Bank, and that's where Jordan was created. The current Jordan as a nation state, uh, the modern nation state in Jordan was created back in 1921 uh, by the British mandate. And under that mandate, Jordan, Palestine, and Iraq were under the British mandate, while Syria and Lebanon were under the French mandate. Uh, now, Circa Palestine was also populated by different nationalities and different religions, Arab, the majority of them. And then Jewish people became to, to migrate to, to Palestine. To, of course, Jews lived in, in Palestine also. Uh, uh, Arab Jews and non-Arab Jews. But majorities of Palestinians are Palestinians, Arabs, Muslims, and Christians. Uh, and they they outnumber the Jews for by by far. Uh, now during the twenties and the thirties, there were lots of things happening. But the main thing was the nineteen forty seven uh, UN decisions resolutions about partition to divide Palestine between the Jews and the Arabs, where the resolution uh, reads that the the this this land will be divided not exactly equally but almost equally between Jews and, and Arabs where Jews uh, you know control less than 50 percent uh, while they're you know controlling almost Palestinians Arabs uh, uh, 50 and some and the reason for that was because the Jews were representing less than 25 percent of the population if not less uh, and that, that resolution was rejected wholesale by Arab countries, except for Jordan. The, uh, you know, late king of Jordan, uh, King Abdullah I, the founder of the, the state of the kingdom, accepted that, actually. And by the way, he paid his life for that because he was assassinated back in 1952. Uh, so Jordan always uh, been very peaceful looking into others and uh, with its neighbors and wanted to promote a coexistence based on the values of the Jordan of the Hashemite of, of the way we live in this part of the world. Uh, now, reasons why Arab, other Arab countries rejected that, not because they're not adhering to the same values. Actually, they do exactly as Jordan does, except for they thought this might be uh, unfair. Well, it was not unfair to them, to the Palestinians. The Palestinians were the many, the majority, and they are getting less land than they used to control. So basically, the resolution was uh, about to take land from the Palestinians and give it to the Jewish community in Palestine. Did not work. 1948 war started. 
Now, in Arabic, it was called a Nakba, catastrophe. 1948 war is catastrophe. In Arabic, a Nakba. And let me just mention this directly and immediately. What we're seeing today in Gaza is actually a repetition to what happened in 1948. The main thing what constituted the Nakba is Israelis' atrocity against the Palestinians, taking the land from the Palestinians, occupying them, and then forcing people to leave, forced migration. Now, what Israel is trying to say and to do these days in Gaza is actually trying to force Gazans to leave Gaza to Sinai in Egypt, which is, first, it is it's illegal. Uh, but it what reminds all Arabs of the Nakba that Palestinians has been through in 1948. Now, since that till today, uh, Arab countries as Arab countries have faced different, I mean, several wars with Israel. Uh, the first one was 1948, as I said, and then was the 1956, when Israel, Britain, and France actually uh, launched a war against Egypt under Abdel Nasser back in 1956, because then Abdel Nasser nationalized the Suez Canal. And I'm certain you know the Suez Canal. It is one of the most important uh, passage uh, linking the red and the white of the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, and it was under the British uh, and uh, French company's control. Uh, and uh, then Abdel Nasser uh, nationalized it. And remember these days, actually, that these are the days where India and Egypt and the rest of the countries were working together as a third party. Uh, you know, uh, it's not the, the West versus the East, but these are the non alignments people, uh, states and countries. And that was led by Nero and Abdel Nasser. Uh, so that's Abdel Nasser that I'm talking about. It's important for you also to have this uh, historical background and, and context. So now there's a second war. And then the third war was 1967, when Egypt and Syria, we called it, you know, uh, June 5th, 1967. And this date is important. You need to memorize it. Because the negotiations about peace today will refer to that. I'll come to that in a minute. So in 1967, uh, um, there was another war between Arabs and Israel, and Israel has won the war. Uh, and the, the countries were party to that war in the Arab. Of course, most of the Arab world, most of the Arab countries, states contributed to the war, but the main major uh, states were Egypt, Syria, Jordan, and Iraq. Uh, well, the war ended up very badly for Arabs and Palestinians, where, uh, you know, after Israel, Israel in the Nakba 1948 occupied what we called it the 1948 land, which is, you know, the historical Palestine, the first part of Palestine, uh, except for the Jerusalem uh, and the West Bank and Gaza. They remain uh, um, not controlled by Israel. In fact, West Bank became part of Jordan back in 1950. Uh, 50. Uh, and that war resulted in Israel occupying the West Bank, which is uh, what we talk about today as a Palestine. And then they occupied Gaza, where the war is now. And Gaza then was ruled, in a way, by Egypt. I'm trying to simplify things. Uh, and the Golan Heights from Syria. Now, except for, uh, and Sinai uh, from Egypt, uh, except for the Sinai, the three uh, areas that Israel occupied back in 1967 are still under Israeli occupation, despite everything happened later, and I'll, I'll come to it. Uh, so that's the, the third war. That's the third war. Now, the second war, I'm sorry, the first war, 1948, resulted in a mass forced migration, created what is known today in the world, the Palestinians' refugees. And the Palestinian refugees counting millions, most of them living in Jordan, and some of them living still in the West Bank and in Gaza, and they're refugees. And that's why the uh, UN and UN system and the international order created a very important organization, UNRWA, the United Nations for Palestinians Refugees, 
to precisely look after Palestinians and provide them with the services. You know, when you're refugees in so many different countries, in Jordan and Egypt and Iraq and Syria and Lebanon and other places, uh, you're not a citizen, and then you have a very limited access to civil rights, to political rights, and more importantly, to socioeconomic standards living. So ARWA came in in order to help, uh, and most of the receiving hosting countries of the Palestinian refugees, uh, Jordan, Syria, Lebanon, and, and Egypt, and the others uh, were not rich, still not rich enough to take care precisely of what needs to be uh, taken care of for, for citizens, or not citizens, in this case, the refugees. Uh, of course, there was a decision from the Arab League uh, not to give Palestinians, refugees in their countries, their countries' nationalities, for good reasons. Because you want to keep the right to return alive. And these Palestinians are refugees under international law, and they have the full right to go back to their homes in Palestine and to be also compensated for the suffering them and their families that they've been facing for too long. Uh, now, 1967 caused the problem of displacements and Nazihin is also pushed hundreds of thousands of Palestine from the West Bank, of Palestinians from the West Bank, and then they came to Jordan, to Syria, to Lebanon, and to other places. So you see, these two wars, these are the main wars, 1948-1967, actually are the base of the conflict today between Israelis and Palestinians. Anyway, 1973, Egypt and Syria launched another war against Israel, where it's called Ramadan War, or Yom Kippur, according to the, to, to the Israelis. Uh, and that is actually October 6th. And I remind you, this uh, new war in Gaza now started on October 7th. So this October month, Yom Kippur is important also in the collective memory for everyone, uh, Jews and, and Arabs. In that, in that war, uh, the uh, Syria, I mean, of course, Jordan uh, was part of that war as well in supporting the uh, brethren Arabs. Uh, the Arab won that war. And the war ended up by Israel give back Sinai to Egypt. But that took 10 years, from 1973 till 1980, 81, 80, yeah, some, some 10 years. Why I'm saying that? Because soon after this war, there had been a truce, and then Sadat of Egypt decided to have a peace with Israel. And that is the... Another history of peace trial between Arab and Israelis and between Palestinians and Israelis. That started even in the 50s. A lot of it was been proposals by Americans and others on the table, but every proposal was actually biased to toward Israel, favor Israel at the expense of the Palestinians. Long story short, that led to what we called the Camp David agreements between Egypt and, uh, and Israel. Uh, ended up, uh, you know, Egypt uh, took sovereignty again over uh, Syria. Uh, but 1982, the Israeli decided to do other thing, to go to war again against Lebanon this time. And that was what we called it the 1982 invasion, Israeli invasion of Lebanon. The war ended up of Israel occupying the southern part of Lebanon, Janub Lebanon. Guess what? A year later, what you know now or hear about it, Hezbollah was established. That's why where Hezbollah comes from. Lebanese wanted to defend their countries and then to liberate their occupied lands from the Israelis. Now, and guess what? Hezbollah did succeed, Lebanon did succeed in, in, in doing that. And it took them maybe 30 years or more. In 2006, famous war between Israel and Hezbollah, uh, Hezbollah forced Israel to withdraw from southern Lebanon. 
except for small parts, Israel kept there called Shab'a farms, Mazara Shab'a. Uh, and the news, if you follow news today, that, you know, the Israelis is, is fighting in its northern border, which is southern Lebanon, between Hezbollah and between Israel. And these uh, attacking, these these things. It's, these are the roots, 1982, and the continuation. Uh, now, in the 80s, the proposals for, for peace between Arab and Israelis continued uh, till uh, the famous Madrid conference back in 1991. And that conference was led by the Americans after their war, I mean, Americans' war against Iraq, that is the, uh, you know, it's called the Second Gulf War. After Iraq invaded Kuwait, this is very quickly for you, in 1990, there was an international coalition led by the Americans. They invaded Iraq. They almost destroyed Iraq and put sanctions on Iraq. And they repeated that again in 2003. But... After that, because of what the Americans done to the Iraqis and to the Arabs, and they felt that it is about time to give up Arab, the Arabs something, and then conference uh, Madrid was uh, there, uh, it resulted in two main peace treaties, another peace of treaties between Israel and Arabs. The first one, and guess this, between Israels and Palestinians, PLO, you know the PLO, the Palestinian Liberation Organization. So by that, now it's called Oslo, the treaty, the peace treaty between Israel and Palestinians, where it was signed on September 13, 1993, by the famous late Arafat and Rabin in the White House. And that was a, a serious moment in the history of the conflict by which the PLO recognized the right of Israel to exist. Of course, they existed without the Palestinians recognizing that. But also for accepting the two-state solutions where Palestinians would be living on the land after 1967 war, the June. Remember that? the 1967 June war and the Palestinians live in peace. I mean, the Israelis in their, in their, you know, the land they, they took back in 1948. So dividing Palestine one more time to two states where Gaza and the West Bank is for Palestinians and the rest of Palestine is for the Israelis. And by that, by the way, that means that the, the Palestinians are giving 78% of the historical Palestine to the Jew which was 28% more than what the UN offered the Israelis back in 1947. So the Palestinians did agree on that. Now it has to do with balance of power, etc., etc., etc. Now the deal and the second treaty was between Jordan and Israel, 1994. Uh, and since then, Jordan and Israel have this peace treaty. Despite all the problems, we kept the peace treaty and we kept the peace. And the Israelis and the Palestinians have that treaty, but they never kept the peace. Because the treaty entailed the following important things. They're going to be a transition in era from 1993 till 1999. By 1999, Israel will withdraw fully from all Palestinian lands, meaning ending the occupation. Okay? Uh, and the Palestinian state will be established. Israel never delivered to that. Now, for so many reasons, but they never delivered to that. And then we have a second intifada back in 2000 and 2001, and it was very violent. And since then, violence never basically stopped in Palestine uh, between, between Israelis and, and the Palestinians. But 2005, because of the growing tensions between Palestinians and Israelis, especially in Gaza, Israel decided to withdraw from Gaza unilaterally. So they left Gaza. It was pain. And it created you know, this area surrounding Gaza, uh, trying to keep you know, Gaza is very, very intensified in terms of population. It's a very small area with more than 2 million people living there. It's the most intensified, you know, place. 
and in terms of destiny, the density of, of, of the populations. Long story short, there are so many reasons for peace to take place in the region. But there are always so many conflicting interests and groups who work against peace. Whether for ideological, political certain views, or even for some very private interests. But regardless of, it just happened in the region, those foundation for none having peace in the region, in, in, in Palestine, to Israelis and Palestinians, uh, always prevailed. Continued all the way till today. Uh, some hope was presented a few years ago, 2020-21, when Israel signed another peace treaties with other Arab countries uh, in the Gulf. That's the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, the Morocco, and the Sudan. And uh, by that, it's now called the Abraham Accord. There was a plan to, or there were discussions actually in the process of having another peace of treaty expanding the Abraham Accord to include Saudi Arabia. Saudi so Arabia Israelis did actually discuss having a peace deal. And by the way, the rest of all our countries, in various ways, they have relations with Israel whether through treaties or through uh, just, you know, practicality. So the issue of Arabs not recognizing Israel is not there, it's there. And states are actually having very solid relations with Israel, different states in their countries. The problem in the region is the Palestinian question. The Israeli occupation of the Palestinian land is the last occupation in history in, the in these days. There's no other single occupation. And this is one of the white man last colonization project in the region and in the world. And you Indians know that more than anyone else. And the Palestinians, all what the Palestinians want is their homeland. That homeland is leave now the historical, you know, evidence and historical context of land being Palestinians. But the United Nations, after the 1967 uh, war, um, you know, there have been two important resolutions, 242. 242 is important for you to know. It means peace for land. It means that Israel has to withdraw from all land they occupy in the war and go back to the borders of June 4th, 1967. This is the problem in the region, that Israel does not want to go to the borders of the 4th of July, 1967, June, I mean, 1967, for reasons has to do with settlements, so has to do with the resources, has to do with the control, has to do with some some crazy ideas in Israel that the whole Palestine and even more than Palestine should actually be Israel, uh, and especially now Israel is governed by a very right wing uh, coalition who actually sees there is no right to Palestinians, and Palestinians should go and live in Jordan. And there's another thing called the alternative homeland. Alternative homeland. That's Al-Watan Al-Badil. So alternative homeland for Palestinians. So Israelis, and it's been there from the very beginning of establishment of Israel in 1948, but only intensified and grow. That Jordan is Palestine, and all Palestinians should move to Jordan and leave the land for the Israelis. Against, of course, as I said, international law, uh, and the UN resolutions that Israel has actually to withdraw from the occupied uh, territories. As we speak, the West Bank is still under the Israeli occupation, 
And as we speak, this war in Gaza actually is one way or another, not only creating a second Nakba for the Palestinians by destroying Gaza fully and pushing people out of their homes and killing the, the, the many numbers you're watching, but, but, but also uh, there is a proposal to reoccupy Gaza again. So in all senses, in all senses, while there, you know, there are multiple treaties, peace treaties between many Arab countries and Israel, and by the way, also the Arab peace offer that is called the Arab Peace Initiative, Arab Peace Initiative of 2002, where all Arab countries in the Arab summit in Beirut back in 20 years ago, they agree, well, look, we offer you a peace with a draw to the free June 5th at Borders, 1967, uh, and apply the UN resolutions 242 and 181, which entails withdrawal and the right of all refugees to go back home. The right of return of Palestinian refugees. You do that, and all Arab countries will have a normal relation with Israel, and Israel will be integrated in the region. The dynamics for the last two decades is about that. Israel doesn't want to withdraw. 